Hey everybody, uh, I'm Steve. I'm going to talk, instead of talking about one presentation, I'm going to talk about a, a, a project, a group of three uh, studies uh, in relation to medical technology adaption or adoption. So I thought I'd start off with something um, applied. So this is my daughter Poppy. Um, she's six and a lot of my colleagues know her. She's, she's the life of the party. She's an absolute firecracker. Um, and she was born in 2014. And when she was about 18 months old, she developed um, pertussis, so whooping cough. Um, and if you've ever seen a child with whooping cough, uh, it's terrible. They can't breathe, they're just constantly coughing out. Uh, and I remember talking to my partner at the time, uh, saying, how could, you know, how could this happen? How could, um, how could you not think to vaccinise your children um, in relation to, to whooping cough? We've had this thing going around at the moment, it's a respiratory thing. Have you heard of it? It's COVID-19. Um, and we're sort of facing this, uh, again, we have the epidemiologists um, have been incredible across the last 12 months and they've come up with these new technologies and we're sort of facing this same question again, but it's not an anti-vaccine question. Um, this new terminology is called vaccine hesitancy. And they're not people that, um, like I said, they're not anti-vaxxers. Um, you know, they're people that believe in the science, they're highly educated. And I think I'm probably one of these people that fall into this, well, you know, I'm not really sure. I'm not just driven in a neoclassical sense around price and quantity. There's lots of contributing factors in relation to me adopting this new technology. I know there's lots of benefits for me as an individual and, and for society. Um, but I think it's important to think about, not just for this product, but um, and I'm going to explain to you in a second around how people understand to adopt or engage with new tech. Um, this is the current advertising campaign from the federal government and they're banking $24 million on that if we stick a whole heap of doctors up there, that'll convince um, vaccine hesitant groups to get vaccinated. And I can almost, sure as I like to bet on a chicken dinner, that won't work. That's not going to work for this vaccine hesitant group because you have people that are pro-vaccinations, -vaccin they'll get vaccinated. And you have anti-vaxxers, they won't get vaccinated. But this new anti, uh, this new hesitant group they believe the doctors, they believe the scientists. What's contributing to their hesitancy is other things. And I'm gonna give you an example now of some work we've done with um, Dittmar and Laura at IBI and um, Professor Ray Chan, who's the head of nursing at QUT, looking at this incredible new technology that they've developed. So this is a breast implant, a saline breast implant, um, and it's obviously defective. That's come out of a human being. Now, what's interesting, um, if I could give you some basic numbers, the US Surgical Society um, states that about 350,000 women undergo um, augmentation every year. That's about, give or take, it's about 1,000 women a day. Now in relation to these things, they're highly toxic and they, and they malfunction. And um, for every implant that goes in, one in three has some form of, or needs some form of corrective surgery in the first 18 months and possibly comes out. That's not one in every three women, it's one in every three implants. So that's quite scary. Um, and what, I wish Dee and Laura were here because it's their tech. They've come up with this incredible technology where before mastectomy or before lumpectomy, women's breasts are scanned. So they have a 3D image of the actual breast. And then um, Dee's engineers 3D print out this scaffold technology on a polymer that dissolves across 18 months. And it's surgically in inserted under the muscle um, tissue and, and muscle is taken from the thigh and pumped into the breast. And as the breast dissolves, you can see here on the right, these are trials from pigs, um, the muscle regrows. And hopefully what they're trying to do is uh, regrow women's breasts. It's an incredible, incredible technology. Um, and what Dee's interested in is, and I think you've seen some of the presentations yesterday in relation to this linear knowledge transition, you know. How do we, not necessarily how do we take things to market, but you can have the most amazing technology, you can have the most amazing medicines, but if people aren't going to use them, what's the point? And this is what's been really interesting about COVID. Um, and again, I'm not taking anything away from the epidemiologists, but the success of combating COVID, particularly in Australia, has been behavioural. Um, getting people to wash their hands, getting people to social distance, people to register and acknowledge um, issues around transmission. And that's not going to change. Even when we do have a vaccine, these behavioural changes are the most important things. So um, here's the research project we set out to look at 
because this is what science is, it's descriptive uh, mapping. We, we set out to understand how breast cancer patients process information, how n breast nurses process information, how surgeons process information, their biases, um, uh, things like expectations and uh, their knowledge, their consultation time, who, who makes the decision? I know it's a binary decision, do you have the operation, do you don't? Um, but a lot, lot more goes into it. Um, so, here's our sample. We ended up with, this is the largest collective sample that I can find in the literature. 761 current or former breast cancer patients, 53 specialist surgeons and 100 nurses. Um, everybody understands some core behavioural bias questions. Um, we asked surgeons, nurses and, and patients a battery of these behavioural bias questions and what we see is, um, unfortunately, well, or fortunately, depending on which way you look at it, no statistically significant differences between these three subpopulations, which tells you the biases are there, um, but whatever is acting on, or what biases are present, are, are parallel and acting in the same way. So if you think about things like risk aversion, all three parties exhibit it, um, and it's all moving in the same way. So what else do we ask? Um, the three groups about. We asked them about consultation time. You know, that first point of contact when you sit down with this specialist surgeon and we asked them about what their experiences were. And we, we asked them, how long, do you remember how long you sat with the surgeon for the first time? And we asked the patients, how long do, um, do you remember? And they said, they said, well, with the surgeon it was about 39 or 38 minutes and with the nurse it was about 27 minutes. I think, okay. Um, and then we asked the surgeons, well, how long do you sit down with the, how long do you think you sit down with the patient for? And they say a bit more, about 45 minutes. And then we asked them, well, how long does the nurse sit down with them? That's about 21 minutes. And what's interesting here is you have two specialist experts, the surgeon and the nurse. Well, let's ask the nurse, how long does the surgeon interact with 30 minutes? That's not 40 minutes like the surgeon thinks. And the nurse, how long do you talk with them? Uh, about 50 minutes which is a lot more than what the surgeons think. So something's happening there in relation to the perception of the surgeon and the nurse in relation to their contribution of time at its minimalist. Someone, when I pre first presented this stuff um, to Dipma's group at um, the Institute for Health and Biomedical Innovation, one of the engineers stood up and said, oh, that's, uh, that's, that's just people's memory, that's their, there's bias in that. And I'm like, yeah, absolutely, of course it is. It's people's perception. And what the problem or what the advantage is, is people's perception influences their expectation. And if you're going into a major surgery, well, your expectation is X, Y, whatever. But if your perception of what you were told or how you thought about the process is very different, then you're going to have issues with, um, you know, satisfaction of whatever that surgical intervention is. So that sort of led into the next question we asked. We're looking at panel B here. We asked patients, surgeons and nurses, we asked them a trade-off between who made the decision on your choice of reconstruction? And we had a scale of 100% your choice all the way down to 100% the surgeon's choice. And on this scale it's represented as 100 is completely the, um, completely the patient's decision, down to zero which is completely the doctor's decision. And, and you see in the violins, it's normal in the surgeon and the nurse, you see a left skew or right skew there, it's, it, the, the bulk is at the left side. But what's really worrying is for lots and lots of women here, about a third of the sample, they say, I had no or, or virtually zero input into my decision for a reconstruction. How can you possibly have informed consent in a surgical procedure if you say that you had no input? And again, this leads us to this question around, well, what happens in the future when we have these defects in our technology? How does that impact um, you know, the surgeon's responsibility, um, the individual's perception of, of what they expected? Um, and this is a, a little bit, we tried to also look at individual differences in our patient population to explore, well, what are some of the drivers, or what can be some of the drivers of their choice to just have a reconstruction or the type of reconstruction that they underwent. And almost all of the literature, you can see all the sociodemographics down the side, they're all the, the key ones that, um, that the sociological uh, research shows, but essentially from qualitative interviews. 
and I'm not here to methodologically knock anyone, um, but there's a Hawthorne effect in, in, a, in a qualitative interview. So if I say, you know, is, uh, is, how, is your private health insurance, does it matter to you about your choice of reconstruction? You'll say, oh yeah, well, maybe it does, I hadn't thought about that. But when you control for the, in the regressions, you control for all of the um, other covariates, everything drops out. The only really um, impactful, statistically significant impact um, shown in, in these patients' decision to have a reconstruction or the type of reconstruction that they choose is their age. That's the only thing. Um, this is the third study and it's, it's only just hot off the presses of the printer. Um, and I'll bring you back to, again, why I think that the advertising in relation to the COVID um, vaccine rollout and vaccine hesitancy won't work. We asked patients, surgeons and nurses, if you were about to transition to a new technology, a new biomaterials technology, where would you get your information from? And if we look in the, the pinky, salmony and the red um, areas, they're the places you'd expect nurses and surgeons to look. Peer-reviewed journals and regulatory bodies. Because that is the process of, um, of going through um, you know, years and years and years of uh, medical training, um, regulatory compliance inside a setting. You're not going to do anything risk-seeking. But what about, what about our um, patients? Where do they want to know about their information? And we're here, we're these three blue ones. And they're all, it's information all coming from a former patient. I know the first two are conduits through surgeons and nurses, but the fact that they're, they're, their trust or their, their information flow is they favour talking to someone that's actually lived it or done it. Tells you a lot about that, um, you know, you can have all of this scientific knowledge. You know, these groups are good at what they do. There's no question. The epidemiologists are good at what they do in relation to the vaccine. But throwing an ad up of um, here are some doctors, here are some professors, um, medicine says it's good is not going to change people's behaviour because people want to, they want the doubting Thomas, they want to touch, they want to see, they want to get the information from, uh, from the coalface. So to the first two of those studies are, are just in press and will be published soon in um, the British Journal of Surgery and the Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. I've got that word wrong. Um, but um, thank you very much and uh, thank you.